All right, welcome to another episode of Revealed Apologetics. I'm your host, Elias Ayala, and today we have a uh, guest here. Last week, I think it was a, oh, what week was it? I think it was the week before Christmas. We had Dr. James White from Alpha and Omega Ministries to talk about the topic of Calvinism and Molinism. And so uh, if Molinism doesn't sound familiar to you guys, um, you can watch the other episode where a Calvinist defines for you uh, what Molinism is. But... Um, I'm going to ask our guest today, who is a Molinist, to uh, define Molinism for us. Um, but the the majority of this uh, discussion um, is so that I can provide my friend here, Tim Stratton from Free Thinking Ministry, to uh, provide a response, a respectful response to Dr. James White and his criticisms of Molinism. Now, I'm a Calvinist. I am on Dr. White's side, yet look what we're doing here. <laughs> look what we're doing here. You have a Calvinist and a Molinist uh, getting along and talking about the issues. And so if anything else, regardless of where you stand on this issue, hopefully uh, interactions like this can just encourage people to look past some of the differences uh, without compromise, of course, and talk about these issues. Um, and, and who knows? Uh, in many cases, you will find that um, we may have a lot more in common than you think. And this That's is why right. I decided to have Tim Stratton here, because when I think of Tim Stratton, I think of two things. I think of Jason Statham, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I the transporter, okay? And I think of a bridge builder. I know that mm. sounds completely uh, opposite, right? Um, I think of a bridge builder. Now, whether one agrees with him or not, uh, Tim really, I think, believes in building bridges uh, between various theological perspectives because really we're, we're really concerned with kingdom work and That's the right. less vision that we have, I think, the better. And so um, I'm just going to provide uh, Tim an opportunity to introduce himself and maybe uh, say a little bit about his ministry, and then we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. So welcome and thank you for coming on, Tim. Man, thanks for having me on your show, Eli. You know, uh, the two of us have been friends for several years now and uh it's you know we've had some fantastic conversations off the record so it's cool now to officially be on the record with you and you know you've really had a big impact uh on many people in fact uh my colleague uh, timothy fox who's one of the other regular contributors on free thinking ministries he told me the other day that if it wasn't for you eli he doesn't know if he'd be in apologetics today he doesn't know if he would have gone to biola university and if you wouldn't have done that, we would have never met. And who knows if free thinking ministries would be a thing. So really, Eli, maybe uh, you're responsible for this whole mess I found myself in. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what's cool is, you know, you used to be a Molinist and now you're a Calvinist. I used to be a Calvinist and now I'm a Molinist. And so we've kind of, you know, we, we passed each other for a while. We were right on the same page for a while because we were passing each other, you know, and but we still aren't too far away. And like you said, I'm really interested in building bridges behind the doors of the church because we live in a day where if the church isn't united, we are in trouble. We have to right. we have some big threats out there uh, that you want to take us down. Um, so while I uh, I love debate behind the doors of the church, really, I'm more concerned with truth. You and I have talked about this before. We're more concerned with truth than we are with being right. And and if you're concerned about truth primarily, then even if somebody shows you that you're wrong, well, it's a win-win situation. Um, but so, I, well, all that to say, I love having debates behind the doors of the church with brothers and sisters in Christ uh, because that's what iron sharpening is all about where you know i think i'm right you think you're right but we're, we're gonna have a respectful sparring match you know i used to do mma you know since you brought up jason statham we'll bring in some <laughs> martial arts i used to do martial arts uh, for a living uh even competed in mma professionally for a little bit only two fights i was one and one well, um, i'm i'm actually black belt in um in karate movies. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. I, I can't contend with that. Um, but, uh, you know, when you spar with your, your friends, you're not trying to injure them. Um, you're, you're trying to 
make them better because you want them to make you better. You want to continue. You want to train again the next day. If you injure them, you're not going to train together again the next day. You've lost a sparring partner. So you're not trying to injure your friends. Uh, you're, you're trying to make them better. Uh, you might be trying to win the sparring match, but you're doing so respectfully. And so that's how I look at um, these conversations with brothers and sisters in Christ who disagree. In the end, we're trying to make each other better. We're, we're trying to make, uh, we're, we're trying to strengthen the other individual. We're trying to strengthen ourselves and we're trying to strengthen the body of Christ in general. So I, I think you and I are cut out of the same cloth in that respect. And so speaking of respect, uh, I do want to offer my respect to the person whose view I'm going to criticize a little bit today. Sure. Uh, so speaking of James White, um, I, I respect him immensely. Uh, you know, first of all, just let me say that uh, Dr. White and I are, so to speak, classmates. Uh, we both attend Northwest University, uh, as far as I uh, believe. Uh, I, I believe he's enrolled, uh, doing some PhD studies at Northwest University. And I just submitted my doctoral dissertation at Northwest University. So while we don't have any official classes together, we're both at the same university. So, um, but, but really, you know, although I respect him immensely, uh, my, the biggest issue I have with uh, James White is that he thinks Star Trek is better than Star Wars. So it's I don't know. <laughs> that, that is blasphemy, right? Well, I mean, so come saying, on. We're on the same side. Yeah, he has no taste in movies whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know, I really love the last Star Wars movie. Um, as far as, you know, the visuals are concerned, I think it was the best Star Wars movie ever made. Yes. Uh, and, and really, the only thing that wrecked... Well, there's two things that wrecked it for... <clears throat> I'm not even going to say it wrecked it. There was two problems I had with it. Okay. One was the gratuitous gay kiss at the end. I mean, come on, we didn't need that. <laughs> yes. But all right, fine, all right. If you want to uh, push that on me, fine. I'll, I'll just pretend I didn't see it. Um, the only other problems, uh, if I were to say it was a problem was that it was trying to fix the mistakes of the previous movie in uh, The Last Jedi, which I thought was a horrible movie. In fact, I would say <laughs> I think that was the worst movie ever made that belonged to a bigger set of right. other movies. Okay. Um, but this last one, The Rise of Star... Uh, the, the Rise <laughs> of... The Rise of Star Trek. <laughs> the Rise of... <laughs> All right. Um, the Rise of Skywalker uh, as a standalone movie might be one of the it's a, it's at the top of the list as far as movies are concerned, and I think one of the best Star Wars movies. It's actually, I know this might blow people's mind and be like, you're ridiculous and I can't trust anything else you say, but actually, Rise of Skywalker was my favorite Star Wars. Not because it had the best characters, but I, I watched Star Wars for action. Yeah. Some of the philosophy of the Force, so the yeah. Empire Strikes Back really captured that the best. That's my favorite, yeah. But when I watch the last of the Skywalker saga, I'm not looking for something deep and penetrating i'm looking to go out with a bang and enjoy myself it had action we it already did. know the characters so i don't need a long explanation it was fast paced yep. and i and it it feels like it would have you know i can see myself watching it multiple times so oh I, yeah that i enjoyed it yeah i've seen it three times already and it actually gets better each time <laughs> so yeah in some regards it's the best star wars movie right. ever um but the original trilogy was great because the story was cohesive. This uh, this last trilogy wasn't, uh, thanks to uh, Ryan Johnson. So, uh, <laughs> thanks a lot, Ryan. Yeah, man, come on. You know, it, it would have been interesting to see what he would have done with an entire trilogy, but we didn't really have a trilogy here. I, I think killed Chewbacca. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. So, yeah, I love I love Star Wars, and in fact. Um, on my website, I did uh, an article called Five Reasons Why the Force is Strong with the Rise of Skywalker, and I tie it into some theology. Sure. And also, man, the Mandalorian, yes. definitely be, he's become my favorite Star Wars character in the entire saga. He's my favorite character. And I, I did an article called Ten Reasons Why the Mandalorian is My Favorite Star Wars Character. So okay. if anybody wants to check those out, you can go to freethinkingministries.com and and check this and I definitely I tie in most of the 10 reasons uh, have theological significance sure. so and I could just interject real quick what I like about and I really do suggest people to check out uh, free thinking ministries 
Um, is it ministry or ministries? Ministries. Ministries, yeah. yeah. What I love what you're able to do is to tie in pop culture with theological issues. And that's yeah. that's really hard because theology could be really dry. Um, right. And I think you do a very good job in capturing theological themes and philosophical themes within movies like The Avengers or something like that. Mm -hmm. when, when I was watching The Endgame and I was thinking about uh, the uh, Doctor Strange, I was thinking, someone should write an article. No on way. What the possible world? And guess what happened? <laughs> Tim Stratton wrote an article on Molinism relating to Doctor Strange, which I thought was, uh, again, even as, as a Calvinist, and I don't hold to Molinism, yeah. I thought it was brilliant. And it was a, mm -hmm. a very creative way to explain that perspective using a popular medium like like a big movie like like uh, Avengers. So I thought that was that mm -hmm. was perfect. So people should really check out uh, your website. Well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. So yeah, I guess you know all of that to say you know it's probably my biggest disagreement with James White, is okay. the Star Trek versus Star Wars. So yes, you know, yes, I agree. I yeah, agree. but but in all seriousness, I want to say this about Doctor White. Uh, I think he gets a lot of things right. And, you know, his work, for example, it's been several years now, but if I remember correctly, there was somebody who came into my office when I was still at the church, and they were telling me that the uh, King James only, or the, you know, the King James version was the only Bible that we ought to use. And uh, I, I believe I gave them Dr. White's uh, material on why that's a, a bad view. Let me just grab that real quick for oh, dear. who may be watching this on YouTube when I post it. But this bad boy here, right? Yep, that's exactly it. Yep. Only controversy. Excellent that's book. That's it. Excellent book. Yeah. So I, I think he does great work uh, in that field. Um, let's see what else. he uh, He's done some great work with uh, or against cults and against Islam. So keep up the great work there. And, and actually, uh, I shared some of his stuff uh, on, on my social media. In fact, uh, a video he did against abortion mm -hmm. uh, well it, he's actually i think speaking to the city council in his area or something yes. like that yes. gave a fantastic talk um and i'll tell you what i will stand side by side next to him um, and, and oppose uh those who advocate abortion the, the, right. one of the greatest evils to ever exist on this planet you know he and i are on the same page so i mean i could go to, uh down the line i'm sure there's other things that uh, we would agree upon. And I just want to say I think he's a, a brilliant mind and a great scholar. And in fact, on the Free Thinking Ministries site, I didn't write it, but there was a um, another author who wrote who asked me if he could write an article defending James White when he was, I thought, unfairly attacked. So anyway, I just want to make it clear that although I disagree with James White on the Calvinism versus Molinism debate, that I really do respect Dr. White. And uh, we've had a little interaction um, after an article that I wrote before I even started Free Thinking Ministries, uh, probably about four or five years ago now. Um, but I would look forward to talking to him again someday. I think we'd get along uh, quite nicely. But I'll yeah. just say this, when it comes to Molinism, uh, I, I do think he's working with, uh, let's just call it an incomplete set of data which I, I think leads him to reach uh, some false conclusions on the topic. So I hope our conversation today can, you know, kind of set the record straight. Um, maybe we can complete his data set <laughs> today. So <laughs> well, you know, well, just real quick, I just yeah. let people know. Um, Tim had expressed to me that once we did the interview with Dr. White, that he was watching the video and taking copious notes, <laughs> and he was doing this on Christmas Day. Apparently, yeah, that's right. the family is so cool that they're okay with him watching theological material on Christmas Day, which I, I think is, is hilarious well, and, and awesome at the same time. It, they weren't just cool with it. I mean, so my mom and dad uh, actually wanted to watch the whole thing with me. And <laughs> and, uh, and I actually had to leave to get back uh, to my wife's side of the family. Okay. Um, we got about, I don't know, halfway through it, maybe, and my parents continued watching it. Uh, okay. Without me, and they, you know, they called me uh, when they got done. Like, yeah, we finished it, and so, uh, yeah, my family, you know, were full of uh, theological nerds. I guess. Uh, awesome. <laughs> my parents had a big impact on me growing up, and awesome. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, I will say that I, 
I think he's working um, uh, with an incomplete set of data. Sure. Um, my only criticism is I think he bears some responsibility for that because I think the, the data is out there. Um, but I know that I do the same thing too. Sure. And there's a lot of things that, I mean, you just don't have time to be an expert on everything. You, you could only say so much too when giving a right. criticism, you can't oh, yeah. cover all of the ground. And I think, I think some of the responsibility is on, uh, is on those who misunderstand and should know better. And I'm not saying, uh, we'll let you give the criticism and, and we'll, people can take it for what it is and, and look into it. But I think, um, for people who are, interested in these topics and really are interested in getting down to the issues, there's a responsibility uh, for them to actually go and read the material. I, I don't think that people's theological training should merely be uh, watching YouTube videos and people critiquing other people. Those are helpful, but right. people really need to get down to the nitty gritty and read <clears> a little bit um, and kind of look at the sources and allow both sides to kind of uh, have that context where they're able to spread out the entirety of their view, which takes work by the listener to actually dig into those issues yeah. because a lot of objections that people have against Calvinism, that people have against Molinism, some of them could be answered if they avail themselves of the literature instead of just isolating their exposure to it by watching YouTube videos and things like that. So I think it's uh, a little bit of both the audience and the people interacting on these, yeah. on these very uh, important ideas. Yeah, I agree. Well, I'll so, tell you, yeah, go ahead. is it, or is it all right, Eli, uh, if before I start talking about, uh, White's comments. I, I noticed a couple things that you said. If you don't mind, I, I'd like to address those that you said during your uh, interview. Is well, that are cool? They, are, are they way of critique? Uh, maybe encouragement uh, a little bit. Um, okay. Because I, I, I mean, wanted to, I wanted to uh, begin with you from a Molinist perspective, defining Molinism for us, and then maybe you can share that, and then we well, can go from there. Well, I, I do have it in my list of things to say to uh, properly define okay. uh, Molinism, but I, I guess, yeah, so, I mean, one thing you said, and, I, and the reason why I think this is important is because sometimes I feel the same way, mm -hmm. um, but you, and, and I think many others do as well, but you, you made a comment that, uh, that you felt like you might be, um, what did you say, drowning in philosophical waters? Yes. Or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I think um, I think that's I mean I I felt like that too. I mean when I was a Calvinist when I first heard about Molinism and I, I first heard Dr. Craig talk about it. I think this was in 2010 or maybe slightly before. And anyway, I, I devoted almost a year of my life to try to refute it um, because I was. A Calvinist. I, I, I was a five-point Calvinist who also affirmed what I call exhaustive divine determinism. And, uh, and so I wanted, once I found out what Molinism was, I wanted to refute it. And I studied it for so long, and, and it just, the philosophy, I, I did feel like I was starting to drown in these philosophical waters. Uh, but then, you know, I, I kind of felt like I was getting swimming lessons along the way. And I became a stronger swimmer in philosophy and really, namely, logic. And so uh, I, I just want to encourage people uh, to, even if you're feeling like you're drowning in these logical waters, to, to they're tough waters to swim in. But I think as Christians, um, we should try to become the strongest logical swimmers uh, we can, you know. And so I, I, I feel your pain. It is uh, deep philosophical, logical waters at times, but I think Christians are, I think, and, and, and Eli, I think you are a, a good thinker. Uh, I think you do quite nicely when it comes to philosophy and, and logic. So I just want to want to encourage you to uh, continue swimming in those waters and, and your listeners as well. But it is tough. It is a tough, um, a, a tough subject. The other thing is uh, you mentioned something about inconsistent exegesis or that you heard Dr. White bring that up in a debate he was having with another uh, friend of mine and uh, and he who's not a Molinist. We're talking about Leighton Flowers. I don't believe Leighton would classify himself as a Molinist. No. Uh, I don't know for he, sure. He sees, it, he sees it as a viable option amongst the various ways that you could understand the right. issues. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, he's very friendly to it. Sure. Um, 
But, uh, you know, I don't want to get into this right now, but the first chapter of my dissertation is uh, showing how I believe that Molinism uh, does the best job of keeping a consistent hermeneutic throughout the entirety of Scripture. So maybe when the uh, dissertation's released, you can have me on to discuss that topic. Yeah, that'd be great. But, yeah, cool. Very cool. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, okay. But, uh, all right, so let's let's go to some of the things that uh, Dr. White said. Um, well, well, real, well, real quick, did, yeah. you, did you want to define Molinism first? Uh, and, let's and, see. And by the way, I'm just I'm just saying that from a listener's perspective, but you can feel free to go whatever. If you think there's a different route you want to go that might be more helpful, you um, can go for it. Well, no, we can do that, and I'll probably get back to this. Sure. Uh, but... I like to start with what I call mere Molinism. Okay. And I think it's uh, pretty easy to define. Uh, mere Molinism, excuse me, mere Molinism entails two essential ingredients, uh, which if one can be proven to be false, then the entire system is going to collapse. So, uh, yeah, mere Molinism, two essentials. One, logically prior to God's decision to create the world, God knew everything that would happen in any possible scenario he could create. And this, if, if that's true, then this entails middle knowledge. And two, as beings created in the image of God, humans, like God, possess libertarian freedom, which simply means the ability to choose between a range of options, each compatible with one's nature. So uh, that's how I define mere Molinism, is by offering those two essential ingredients. So I have a question. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, I guess I'll mention names, but I'm not going to, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I had spoken to um, Eric Hernandez, who's a Molinist, mm -hmm. and he helped me out a lot in understanding Molinism <laughs> as a view of God's omniscience, but it didn't necessarily entail anything about libertarian freedom in just its bare definition. Like, right. like it applied. So, so would you say that middle knowledge and the issue of libertarian freedom are two essential features of Molinism or can you have Molinism without libertarian freedom? You can have, so I, I I'm good friends with Eric. Okay. Um, you can, you can use, uh, so middle knowledge is, uh, What's middle knowledge is required here, but if Molinism is actually true, that if it actually uh, describes reality, then humans will possess libertarian freedom. And so that's what I'm talking about when it comes to mere Molinism. Now, uh, and, and one thing I'm going to talk about with uh, something that Dr. White said uh, later on is, you know, he, he says that... Uh, I can't remember. I have it in my notes. As we, we go, I'll, I'll make sure I get it right. But he says that it assumes the reality of free creatures uh, that middle knowledge does. And that's just not true. Um, uh, you can have a completely determined world, completely determined creatures across the board, and God could still have middle knowledge if he possesses the power to create free creatures, even if, if, even if he never does. Um, because then if he's omniscient, so, so if God possesses the power to create a free creature, even if he never does, and God just determines creatures across the board, but he mm -hmm. could have created a free creature. Well, if he's, if he's omniscient and he knows how that free creature would have freely chosen, then he's got middle knowledge. But I don't think Molinism is true. I just think middle knowledge is true at that point. So I just argue for those two essentials, that if Molinism describes reality, the way things are, then God will have middle knowledge and humans will possess libertarian freedom. And libertarian freedom can be defined several different ways, right? You've got sourcehood libertarian freedom, which even if for some weird and strange reason, no one could actually choose otherwise, but if they are the real source of their choices, um, then you've still got libertarian freedom. Can, um, can I ask a question? Uh, and I apologize. Sure. I don't want to throw you off track with my questions, but... Uh, I got it, John, so I want to take advantage. You can say something. I want to... <laughs> yeah. So you make a distinction between Molinism and middle knowledge? It seemed it sounded like you made a distinction. Well, there. yeah. Molinism okay. requires middle knowledge. So if mere Molinism is true, what I argue for, mere Molinism is true, then God has middle knowledge and humans possess libertarian freedom. Mm -hmm. And and the, and and usually, I mean, because there's 
uh, there's Calvinists who believe that God has middle knowledge, you know, and there's determinists who could also believe that God has middle knowledge. You know, there could be exhaustive divine determinists who also affirm that God's got middle knowledge. So, uh, so for Molinism, for mere Molinism to um, describe reality the way things are, uh, God needs middle knowledge and humans need libertarian freedom. And typically, so I said there's several ways to understand libertarian freedom. You've got sourcehood, and uh, I, I think sourcehood is vital, but I also uh, define libertarian freedom um, as uh, the ability to choose between a range of options, uh, of alternative options, each compatible with human nature or each compatible with an image of God nature. So uh, anyway, so that's mere Molinism, and I can say more about that later as we as we go on. Sure. So uh, let's let's define Molinism for someone who hasn't listened to the previous thing, and we don't have to stand the definition too long. Just let us define our terms first, and then maybe we could jump right into some of the things that you thought that Dr. White was off on in his criticism. And then, of course, if people are familiar. If they're not familiar with what he disagreed with, they can go back and listen to the original content. Okay. okay. So so I just did define Molinism as those two essentials. Those two essentials. So you said yeah. you said middle knowledge and and um libertarian, libertarian freedom. freedom. Humans but I, possess I guess, I guess maybe I missed it. Did you describe the three moments of God's knowledge in that? Oh not yet, but I'll get to that. Okay, that's what I was figuring because yeah, I figured yeah. that that's kind of gives people the framework. Well, what are you talking about? Right, middle, right, middle right. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, I, I, I will get to that. Sure. So, um, so yeah, I think, uh, you know, some of the preliminary comments here that Dr. White made, uh, and this isn't an exact quote, I don't think, but basically saying that um, we're complaining that not all Molinists uh, firm the same flavor of Molinism, you know, because uh, he's talking about he wants to debate Dr. Craig and others will say, well, okay, Dr. Craig believes that about Molinism, but you need to talk to this Molinist. And, uh, you know, so yeah, it's true. Not all Molinists are created equal. And, you know, I'm, I'm friends with many Molinists, and we disagree on several aspects of Molinism. Um, but, you know, quickly, I'd say the same is true for, for Calvinists. <laughs> you know, some, I think it's probably worse than the Calvinist camp, maybe I don't know, maybe uh, I'd like your thoughts on that, but, you know, there's disagreement on the five points. I mean, you got five-point Calvinists and four-point Calvinists, and, you know, the five-point Calvinists will say, well, you're not really a Calvinist, and, you know, that goes back and forth. But there's also uh, five-point Calvinists who also affirm limited libertarian freedom. So not only is there disagreement regarding the five points, but you have those who affirm all five points, but who disagree on exhaustive divine determinism and limited libertarian freedom. And, you know, and, and Calvinists uh, who affirm uh, libertarian freedom in, in a limited sense would include guys like Oliver Crisp and uh, Mueller and uh, Kevin Tempe. And, you know, he's told me in, in some aspects uh, he would consider himself a Calvinist. Uh, Alan Plantinga. Uh, Greg Kokel of Stand to Reason um, is a great example. These guys um, are all examples of Calvinists who affirm limited libertarian freedom. Um, in fact, I know some Calvinists who also affirm Molinism. Uh, for example, Kirk McGregor's wife. Um, you know, she's in the Presbyterian Church and as a uh, minister in the Presbyterian Church, uh, and she she uh, affirms. Calvinism, five-point Calvinism, and also affirms Molinism, if I understand Kirk correctly. So, at least what I refer to as mere Molinism, and uh, and how I described it. So, um, so I want to get that out there. But the next of White's comments that I think demand a response is when he mentioned that uh, William Lane Craig won't debate him. And and Dr. Craig, he's kind of been like a mentor to me. Uh, but, you know, Dr. Craig has had it as a policy for a long time that he doesn't want to debate mm -hmm. um, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in an academic forum like he does against, you know, guys like Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and, and guys like that. He wants to show that atheism is false in the public square. He wants to show that Christianity uh, is true in the public square. 
um, and he doesn't want to get sidetracked. He knows his mission, and uh, he wants to stay focused on that. Uh, but, uh, you know, White went on to say that something like that he couldn't find anybody who's, I think he said, really representative of Molinism who's willing to debate him on the topic. And, you know, uh, Kirk McGregor, who literally wrote the book on Molina, and in my opinion, uh, is the leading expert in all things Molinism today, because unlike Dr. Craig, Molinism is really his primary focus. Right. Um, he is ready and willing to debate Dr. White. And in fact, I believe McGregor has reached out to White's camp to let to let him know that he is willing to have this discussion. Now, if he hasn't got that message, uh, you know, pass that along to him, that Kirk McGregor would love to have that conversation with him. Right. And, you know, also, if he wants to get close to debating Dr. Craig, well, Kirk, like me, we're, we're both licensed, reasonable faith chapter directors under Dr. Craig. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think Kirk McGregor is the guy. Uh, and I'd be willing to have that conversation too, but really, Kirk yeah. is... I, I always thought, and of course, Dr. White is free to debate whomever he wants, just as mm -hmm. Dr. Craig has his goal and mission, I'm sure right. Dr. White has his own goal and what he wants to focus on. Um, but if he really wanted to debate the issue of Molinism, I would see a debate with Dr. McGregor as a strategic move in getting Dr. Craig's attention as to some of the serious criticisms that if they're that serious and don't hold up against someone like Dr. McGregor, maybe... Dr. Craig would comment on that and maybe have some, maybe not right. even a debate, kind of like um, my my kind of, my dream interaction would be uh, Dr. Craig and Dr. White um, kind of having a sit-down uh, discussion, kind of like what he did with uh, Lawrence Krauss um, on the topic right. of um, Molinism and Calvinism and then a separate talk on apologetic methodology. I think those yeah. two great and interesting, mm -hmm. more kind of in a casual uh, setting, although yeah. In a perfect world, right? This it's not one of the worlds. Got, got to actualize, can't actualize that world. Um, yeah, I think he's very. I think he's very um, equipped to debate those issues with Dr. White, and I, I just wish um, that that was uh, an option. But be that as it may, we're talking about it, and so um, yeah. if we can't get two people to debate these issues, then why not just? talk about it and have the dialogue going where people can interact with these ideas to yeah. the best of their ability. So, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. So, so let's, right. let's, let's jump in. So, so what are yeah. some of the specific areas that, uh, cause we really haven't touched at the core uh, complaint of Dr. White. Um, uh, what, what did you perceive his core complaint against Molinism to be? And uh, once you lay that out, how would you respond uh, to those critiques? Um, well, you know, the first thing, is defining Molinism. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in your interview, you asked to define it, and uh, Dr. White said something to the effect of, you know, we don't have enough time for that. Well, I've already defined it. It didn't take very long. It only takes a few seconds. And I think it's dangerous when we don't define what we're going to attack. Because when we don't define things that we're attacking, it's really easy to attack a straw man. Mm -hmm. And not the real thing. And I think that's what happened. Um, so again, uh, basically, I mean, to, to keep it very simple, to affirm mere Molinism is, uh, you know, I mean, there, there's two things that are essential to Molinism. I already mentioned them. And that's, you know, every Molinist worthy of the label is going to affirm these two things. God's middle of knowledge and human liberty and freedom. And again, I'll say it again. Uh, just to clarify, mere Molinism entails two essential ingredients. Um, one, logically prior to God's decision to create the world, God knew everything that would happen in any possible scenario he could create. And this entails God's middle knowledge. And two, as beings created in the image of God, humans, like God, possess libertarian freedom, which simply means the ability to choose between a range of options, each compatible with one's nature. Actually, it doesn't even mean that much. You, like I said, you could just have sourced libertarian, but that's uh, the the definition of free will that I spend the most time defending is the ability to choose between a range of options, each compatible with one's nature. And like I said, with you know, when we're talking about humanity, our image of God nature, which allows us to do this. So. Right. Um, so the debate really needs to begin here with those two essential uh, pillars or ingredients, if you will. But 
uh, let's see. Um, just real quick, you yeah. the, your definition of libertarian freedom, yeah, for those who are more philosophically subtle in their definitions, what you've defined is soft libertarian freedom. We don't have to go into the soft and hard differences, but am I correct that there's a difference between hard libertarianism and soft libertarianism? You just defined soft libertarianism, right? Well, you know, it depends on who you talk to, and uh, I just like to keep it simple because I think okay. when you get into hard and soft, that confuses people. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I just, you know, the, the the most essential thing to libertarian freedom is if there is no external causal determinist, uh, deterministic factor. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um yeah, if I am the source of even some of my thoughts, and it's not uh, somehow either directly or, or indirectly causally determined by someone or something else, if I can actually think and evaluate a concept, uh, um, if I can actually think and evaluate a concept, that, say the concept of libertarian freedom or the concept of middle knowledge, if I am doing that on my own and nothing else is doing that for me, then I've got libertarian freedom, even if for some reason I cannot think otherwise or do otherwise. If I am the source, then I've got libertarian freedom. But like I said, I'm more interested in arguing uh, for, uh, you know, some people say, say this is a fancy way of saying the ability to do otherwise. I just like to say, hey, if you've got the ability to choose between a range of options, each of which is compatible with your image of God nature, then you've got uh, libertarian freedom. Okay. Um, so what? So, so what specifically? Okay. So we have libertarian freedom. You, you defined it the way the way you did. Yeah. What is the specific objection of Doctor White? I think because because for example, when you talk about libertarian free acts and you talk about God's knowledge of counter counterfactuals of creaturely freedom, which exist logically prior to His divine decree. I think what he was getting at is how is that possible? How is their knowledge of what a creature would do independent of a decree? It would seem as though in order for God to know what someone would do, he would know what they would do because that is a world that he would have decreed. There seems to be right. this idea that there are the truth values of what this hypothetical creature would do, but it's independent of a decree, which, which really acts as the creative plans and intentions that God desires to carry out. How would you respond to that, what we call the grounding objection? Yeah, uh, well, I've got a lot to say on this. And okay. so I've written out a whole bunch of things I want to get to, and that's down on my list, but I'll quickly okay. All right. No, uh, but just know that I'm going to get to more of this later if you don't mind. Sure, sure. sure. <clears throat> but that's a how question. That's an interaction objection. Um, and you know, theologians, including Calvinists, are fine with appealing to some mystery here and there. Okay. Um, but I would say if one denies, uh, well, it comes down to this. Does God, does an omnipotent God have the power, right? The ability and the power to create a being in his image who can make choices who can choose between a range of options, each compatible with his image of God nature. Does God have the ability and the power to create that being? Now, if he, if he doesn't, then God's not omnipotent. I don't think he wants to go there. But if he does, it raises another question. Does God possess the knowledge? Does he have the intelligence to know? what this free creature within God's ability to create, does this free creature that God could create, um, who would possess uh, libertarian freedom, does God then possess the knowledge of how this free creature would freely choose, even if God never creates him? Now, if well, one says no, then they're denying omniscience. Well, that assumes, it seems to me, that the notion of a person who can choose certain things, they, they can choose certain things, you can correct me if I'm wrong, independent of a decree, that God could have knowledge of what these person people would do, independent of a decree. So No, I'm, I affirm the decree. You right, do, so, but, yes, it's so, not, but God's knowledge is, count, is logically prior to the decree. So I guess the question is, how do we make sense out of what a person would do logically prior to a decree. It seems like what they would do is a result of God decreeing a world in which they use their 
their God-given ability to do precisely what they do. All right, so the bottom line is this. Does God have the power to create a free creature? Well, it depends. Well, it would say that the, does God have the power to create a libertarianly free creature? And right. That's the, that's the question. If you're okay. asking me personally, right. I don't know because I don't know <laughs> if it's um, – I don't know if it's a coherent concept because a lot oh oh of people, let me stop you there. It's got to yeah, be a coherent concept unless say again. Uh, it's got to be a coherent concept okay. if God's omnipotent, because omnipotence by definition means that God has options, and it stands to reason that God does not do all that He's powerful enough to do. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, God could have at least not created the universe. Obviously, we know he did since we're having this conversation, mm -hmm. but uh, to say that God had to create this universe would bring us into some severe theological problems. Um, uh, God doesn't need us. He was completely fine without us, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, a, it's just by grace alone that he yeah. chose to create. So God has a range of options, each of which is compatible with his divine nature. He can at least create or not create, okay. and he chose to create. So God has libertarian freedom. He can choose between a range of options, each compatible with his nature. So the question, the con or the concept, is not incoherent at well, all because God has it. So the question now is: yeah. Can God create humans in His likeness who can also choose between a range of options, each compatible? with our image of God nature. Now, I don't expect you to answer that right now, okay. but yeah. but that's what I'm going to push. That's okay. what I want Dr. White to answer. Now, uh, I believe that if one says, no, God does not have that power, then there's you, you run into uh, problems. You're denying, one would deny God's omnipotence. Mm -hmm. So most of the Calvinist theologians I have talked to <clears throat> will affirm, yes, God does have the ability to create a free creature, but he did it. Uh, and I say, fine. Uh, fine. I disagree with you there for several reasons, and I'll talk about some of those later. But if I grant you that, and you affirm that God has the power and ability to create a free creature, then I ask the next question. God, since he's omniscient, uh, doesn't he know how that free creature within his power to create would how he would freely choose. If he doesn't, then you've got some flavor of open theism on your hands. And I know James White would be against that because he and I both uh, right. oppose open theism. That's correct. And, and you don't want to even, I don't even think you want to affirm open theism in some possible worlds. So you got to have Molinism or uh, you got to have middle knowledge. Middle knowledge is the only way to make sense of this. Um, once, so I've argued at length on my website and I'll get into this more uh, later as we talk. But I think can if I one ask of, a real, can I ask a quick question though? I'm sorry. Hold that thought. I just want to say if you affirm omnipotence and omniscience logically prior to creation, then you've got some flavor of Molinism. Well, Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I guess this is, I guess a personal, a personal question. I don't see that if God has libertarian freedom, and if you were to ask me that question, I don't know the answer to that. I, if God eternally knows what he's going to do, he's gonna, he knows what he's going to do from all eternity, uh, could he do something different? I think hypothetically, there's nothing that lacks within his nature. But if he's eternally de uh, determined within himself to do something, uh, he will never do other than... All right, well, listen. But, before, but that's not my question. My but question nothing is... Yeah, that, I'll just say that that's... That's still libertarian freedom because nothing else is causally determining him. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. But my question is that if God were to have libertarian freedom, I don't see it. And I'm not saying it's false, but I don't see that it logically follows that therefore derivative creatures can have that sort of freedom since God is original in his action, whereas we are derivative. The very well, fact that we're derivative, right. Um, anything that we – you get into whole issues of – being a, you have that whole creature, a creator creature distinction. So I'm kind of seeing, right. I'm, I'm not saying libertarian well, freedom is the false. same thing is true with God's that knowledge. Not having it logically entails that creatures have it. It doesn't logically entail that we do, but right. since the concept would be logically coherent, and God being omnipotent can do all logically coherent things, can do okay, all things right logically there. possible. Right, he right can, there. doesn't mean he does, but I he know. can. Right. But right there. So, so. 
to say that the idea of libertarian freedom is coherent for God does not logically entail that it's logically coherent for a derivative creature. Well, yeah, okay. Have but, that logic. Well, know. look, it doesn't logically follow that we are free, but if it's logically possible for God to be able to choose between a range of options, each mm -hmm. compatible with his nature, right? So the concept then of libertarian freedom is coherent and okay. logically uh, possible, or it's okay. logical. And if God can do all things logically possible, then it stands to reason, unless I have some good argument against it, Sure. That God could, if he wanted to, and even if he never does, mm -hmm. that God could create creatures who possess an ability to choose between a range of options, each compatible with their image of God nature. And and, and this is a, an image, a likeness. It doesn't mean we have the ability to do, obviously, you, humans can't create universes from nothing. Right, but we can create some things, right? We have an image. We have a likeness. We, we are creators. Um, we don't have... Middle knowledge, but we do actually possess counterfactual knowledge uh, to high degrees of certainty anyway. Uh, we can't, you know, so we're not completely free, but we have limited libertarian freedom. Um, and, and, you know, mo even most Calvinistic theologians would say that Satan had uh, the libertarian freedom to, to choose to reject God or not, or that Adam and Eve did. Um, and many Calvinists, including and I, I go into this in my dissertation, Calvin and Luther, and especially Melanchthon, you know, these great reformers, uh, do, I have, I have the block quotes to make my case, they, uh, they affirm limited libertarian freedom, that is, the ability to choose between a range of options, each compatible with their nature, not applied to salvation issues. So they're going to affirm the five points of TULIP, but, and like, you know, Greg Kokel does this, really well and uh, Oliver Crisp and and uh, a few others uh, Mueller um, but Greg Kokel I think does a great job in his book Tactics he is a five point ardent Calvinist I've argued with him uh, we, we've gone round and round he's a five point Calvinist but to his credit he affirms that humans must possess limited libertarian freedom or else we could never make any rational affirmations and believe me Towards the end of our conversation, I have a whole bunch I want to say about that because you brought this up to Dr. White uh, in your conversation. But but there are, the, I mean, I would contend that the vast majority of Calvinists would at least contend that God has the ability to choose between a range of options, each compatible with his nature, that follows from omnipotence, and that he at least has the power to create creatures who can choose between a range of options, each compatible with our image of God, nature, even if that's not applied to salvation. So you can still keep your five points and still affirm uh, that God's got middle knowledge and even affirm uh, that we've got libertarian freedom in some things, even if it's not applied to salvation, and therefore you've got some flavor of uh, Molinism, which I call mere Molinism. So I contend that you can be a five-point tulip Calvinist and a two-point mere Molinist, and I know these people. I know these people that affirm both. So that's seven uh, points, man. That's too. Many yeah, that's points. right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. So we can get I'm into seven more of that. Points, Calvinist Molinist. <laughs> that yeah, that's really right. A lot to go through. And I'll tell you. I mean, if I were convinced that I was wrong about applying Molinism to salvation issues, that's exactly what I would do. I would, mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, go back and affirm the five points of Tulip, and also affirm what Calvin and Luther and Melanchthon said. Mm -hmm. about what I call limited libertarian freedom, and then I would appeal to middle knowledge to make sense of that. Uh, so there does not have to be a debate. Uh, you can be a Molinist and a Calvinist, and in fact, that's why I'm at the same Reformed University that uh, James White is at. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, they they seem to have, uh, I mean, we, we, <laughs> we went round and round about that, if, uh, if I can be Reformed or not, and in sure. the end... Uh, I think I made my case, and so yeah. I. Well, you have I, the beard, so you're okay in my. Uh, yeah, I got it started here. You know, I'm so, on the so right track. So let's so let's zoom in to a couple of uh, of of the main contentions with with Dr. White. So let, let's continue down around uh, down that route. So, um, what's what's the next point you'd like to respond to in regards to something that he said? Uh, you know, he said something to the effect that Molinism was never derived from Scripture. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, gosh, which I, is the biggest, which is the biggest issue for for Calvinists 
and which was linked yeah. to which was linked to my personal study. Um, I think there's a, there's an answer to why most many Molinists today come off as being overly philosophical and not as biblical as many mm. Calvinists would feel comfortable. I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong or anything like that. all right. truth is God's truth and if something's philosophically coherent it's philosophically coherent and it, it's it's true if it reflects the scriptures but right. um, when I studied Molinism I felt like I wasn't it, it felt like it was an attempt to answer a theological and philosophical puzzle as opposed to something that is derived from the text it's almost as though it's something that can fit with the text when you're trying to answer this question but not so much derived from the text itself. Now, real quick before you interject, mm -hmm. and I'm sure, and I'm, I'm excited to hear how you would respond to, to that, because I'm not the only one who feels that way. It's my idea, or kind of my understanding, that because Molinism has been popularized by Alvin Plantinga and William Lane Craig, yeah. and it comes primarily through the philosophical works of Molina, mm -hmm. that when people catch on to Molinism from a popular level, that's their exposure to it. As, as Dr. McGregor said uh, when I spoke with him uh, a few years back, he said that a lot of Molina's works in regards to his biblical defenses haven't been published. And so when yeah. people learn about Molina, they're, they're coming at it primarily from that philosophical bent, and then they latch on to that, and that's kind of how Molinism is presented, this purely philosophical perspective. Yeah. And so how would you kind of respond to something like that and kind of put some cal...
Calvinists at ease and say, wait a second, there's some biblical, you know, support here, you know, because that's definitely right. something that we struggle with. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, how Molinism has been popularized uh, might have actually done some damage <laughs> in that sense. Um, so I think that's, uh, you, you might be onto something there. You know, Molina himself, uh, I can't remember how many pages. I think it was sixty some pages is what he's he started with uh, of of, of uh, biblical data. So he started with biblical data as his foundation. And um, when it comes to my dissertation, which is focused on this subject, you know, I, the first chapter is all about um, you know key concepts. And really, I spent a bunch of time regarding hermeneutics and how to have a logically consistent hermeneutic. And if you want truth, Christianity is true. It will always be logical because truth and logic are inextricably linked. You can't have one without the other. Um, that doesn't mean we'll always be able to you know, connect all the logical dots. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean the logical dots aren't out there to be connected. Um, so, I mean, and maybe you'll disagree with this, but it seems to me that both Molinism and Calvinism are both philosophical attempts to try to make sense of biblical data. But maybe there's some pushback there. But I guess I would say, you know, I start out with in my dissertation about talking about how to do a, a correct hermeneutic that I believe, especially that Calvinists are going to affirm. Um, second, I go through all the biblical data. Well, not maybe not all of it, but I have a really long second chapter. And I start out by looking at all the verses that might, uh, you know, influence one to affirm determinism or exhaustive divine determinism, which many Calvinists affirm. And then I look at all the verses that might lend to somebody saying, no, we have an, a real ability to choose between a range of options, each compatible with our image of God nature, um, limited libertarian freedom. And then I look at some that even... Uh, you know, some that apply determinism when it comes to salvation, some that even uh, imply libertarian freedom when it comes to salvation issues. And I, I don't, in, in the second chapter, I, I don't try to uh, make any conclusions. I just have all these categories and I like, look, there's biblical data across the board that, um, yeah, well, I mean, there's biblical data, both Old and New Testament, that the determinists can point to. And there's biblical data, both Old and New Testament, that the, the libertarian freedom fighter can can point to. <laughs> you and made so the libertarian I, sound so much more noble. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, um, you're the empire. You're the rebel. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so, you know, I mean, so ultimately... Um, you know, I say these are either contradictions, which nobody wants to affirm, right? I don't affirm that. And I know James White wouldn't affirm it either. And I know you wouldn't. But I, I say you got to have a view um, or, or you can't promote a view that doesn't make sense of all of them. Um, and so I believe that this philosophical view of Molinism, when you view the entirety of scripture through that lens, it makes sense of the whole thing. It can make sense of every, every passage. Uh, and I don't think a deterministic view, uh, an exhaustive divine deterministic view, whether it be Calvinism or any other view like that, I don't think that's going to work across the board. It will make sense of big chunks of scripture, but I don't think it will for all of it. But, um, that's uh, I do think uh, Molinism is biblical. Uh, I do make that case uh, then in my dissertation, and, and, and I've got a short, relatively short, uh, pop level beginners article on my website called Molinism is Biblical, where I, I go through uh, the passages of Scripture that would affirm both uh, God's counterfactual knowledge and human limited libertarian freedom, and then I say, okay, if God's got counter factual knowledge and if he has that knowledge now this is this is philosophical here because the bible doesn't say uh god possesseth middle knowledge right? <laughs> uh, but it doesn't say god possesses right, right 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 <laughs> uh, but so you've got to take and it doesn't say god possesseth natural or free knowledge either which i we'll, we'll get into soon and i know dr white will say that uh god has 
So you look at the biblical data and then you try to think about it logically, which is simply oh, no, okay. what it means to make philosophical sense of it. We're thinking about it logically. How do you logically make the most sense of all the biblical data from Genesis to Revelation? And and so uh, that's that's my goal. I'm, I mean, and I'm not a philosopher. I'm a, a systematic theologian who takes philosophy and logic quite seriously. Um, so I, I just think that Christians should be uh, not just committed to excellent uh, theology and biblical exegesis and hermeneutics, mm -hmm. but also committed to logic and and good philosophy. Not shallow lo uh, philosophy, but but good God honoring right. philosophy that uh, makes I sense of biblical data. Yeah, I think it's important for, um, and I'm not saying that I agree with your explanations necessarily right. you know we're giving an opportunity for you to share your thoughts and, and definitely I, I will continue to think about these things yeah. but i think a lot of calvinists need to understand because you know stereotypically speaking stereotypically speaking calvinists tend to be biblically minded i'll say stereotypically because we have our philosophies as well and things like that right right, um, right but we need to be very careful to talk down against philosophy because the bible does not teach that we should avoid philosophy rather it teaches us to avoid a particular kind of philosophy a philosophy that is, is according to uh worldly principles and things like that now now is molinism that that's that's the argument is calvinism that that's, right. that's the argument and so that's <laughs> yeah, why great. we have these discussions but we don't yep. avoid philosophical reflection um we can't we can't pow pow you know give the tap on the hands of the molinists for using uh, you know, logical priority and things like that, but then, but then the Calvinist gets away with speaking about superlapsarianism and all these other sorts of things. So <laughs> right. we have to play fair in, in yeah. these kinds of discussions. But, but go ahead. What were you going to uh, continue on? Go ahead. Well, that's just well said. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, you and I get along so well. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, and you've mentioned this. We should probably, uh, for those of your listeners who might be new to this conversation, uh, we need to explain what middle knowledge is in the middle of. <laughs> and uh, and I just uh, made some comments about natural and free knowledge. So let's describe all this. Uh, natural knowledge uh, is all that God could do. That's how I like to define it. God knows everything that he could do, right? So if God's got natural knowledge, he knows based on his, he knows he's omnipotent, and he's also omniscient, so he got, he knows everything he could do. Uh, middle knowledge is all that would happen if, right? What would happen based on all the things that God didn't do, right? Uh, all the, what would happen based on everything that God could do? Um, and then you've got the divine decree, God's decision. So, uh, and then you got free knowledge after that, and that's God's knowledge of all that actually will happen. So, you know, Dr. White uh, made some comments, you know, he said traditionally theologians recognize God's natural knowledge and his free knowledge and talked about uh, even into the Middle Ages, what people uh, thought about it. Um, and just really that's, that's irrelevant. Um, what matters is, is if God knows everything he could do, and it stands to reason then that, you know, there's a whole bunch of things God could do even that he never did. Um, but if God knows, so, so imagine for your listeners who know the Kalam cosmological argument, <clears throat> you know how the Kalam gets us all the way back to, uh, to God existing in what I like to call a static state of a seity. It's God existing alone as a Trinity and nothing else, right? Nothing else actually exists. But in that static state of a seity, God knows everything he could do. He's, he's both omniscient and omnipotent. So that means that God knows everything he could do. And he knows all that would happen if he did it. Any of those things that's within his power to do. Then God chooses. And and this is uh, not chronologically speaking, uh, but logically speaking. God makes a choice. What is he going to create? He makes that choice. And now God has free knowledge. And that just simply means that God knows everything that actually will happen. And I contend that also means everything. He knows all that I will freely choose, right? Even if I'm free to do otherwise, mm -hmm. and even if for some reason I don't have the ability to do otherwise, even if it's, I'm the source, God knows all that I will freely do. So predestination 
is a big part of Molinism. We affirm predestination across the board. In fact, uh, I affirm double predestination, which <gasps> many, yeah, many Calvinists are scared to do, right? <laughs> no, you um, don't. Come on. I do. I do. I, I affirm predestination of all that happens across the board. Um, so I just, uh, what I reject is exhaustive divine determinism or ed edd is what i call it so you make you say it like that you make it sound like it's a disease ed <laughs> hey i have friends i have friends named ed so it's it's all good. okay all right, uh, so um so yeah ultimately i think this comes down i think i mentioned it earlier but you know i, I think it boils down to this question uh, for the calvinist and, and and i'd love to hear dr white answer this question does an omnipotent god who has the ability to choose between a range of options each compatible with his nature possess the ability the power to create creatures in his likeness who possess the ability to choose between a range of alternative options each compatible with our our image of god nature so if god merely possesses this ability even if he actually never creates creatures in his likeness, then God, if he's necessarily omniscient, must possess middle knowledge. And, and then, you know, you could say that some flavor of Molinism's got to be true at that point. Uh, mm -hmm. But I add, it doesn't, it's not, you know, again, I haven't proven li uh, human libertarian freedom here. I just say, say that it's possible for humans to possess uh, limited libertarian freedom. Um, but then I have other arguments that show that we do possess limited libertarian freedom, just as Calvin, Luther, and Melanchthon would affirm. Uh, so if that's the case, then then some flavor of Molinism has got to be true, even if five-point Calvinism is true. So another thing I'd like to mention that, that White said is he made a statement, and he said, how we act is derived from who we are. Now, I just want to say, why think a thing like that? Or at least ask that question. Why think a thing like that? In fact, you know, if this is part of his argument, it would be, it seems to me, an example of, of begging the question. Um, but I'll give the benefit of the doubt there and not uh, say that, that is exactly what's going on here. But Can you repeat but, the phrase again? Uh, he says, uh, how we act is derived from who we are. That assumes uh, causal determinism. Um, it, it, it usually, anyway, and I think this is what he means. I'd like to hear him flesh this out a little bit more, but I know many Calvinists, when they say things like this, assume uh, that libertarian freedom is impossible. Uh, and, well, I'll, I'll explain here a little more. Um, because I think White seems to be assuming uh, compatibilistic determinism is true with a statement like that. But why can't compatibilistic libertarianism be true. And by the way, I describe myself as a compatibilistic libertarian. Uh, so I affirm compatibilism in a sense. Um, okay. So oftentimes, uh, compatibilism and libertarianism are offered as opposites or things that oppose each other. Uh, but I, I like to nuance things here a little bit because, I mean, if you listen to the way I've defined libertarian freedom, the, the view that I like to argue for, Again, listen to it. The ability to choose between a range of alternative options, each compatible with an image of God nature. So based on that definition, I affirm a flavor of compatibilism here. Um, and often to, I think there's a lot. I, I don't reject uh, compatibilism when, when there's only one thing capable uh, with my nature to do at all times. I think sometimes that's true. I think... Uh, this Edwardsian view from Jonathan Edwards is often true. I just argue that you cannot apply it across the board exhaustively. Um, so I, I think uh, compatibilism often described when uh, conjoined with determinism is often true or an inability to do something else. I think that view of compatibilism is often true. But then I say, well, even with limited libertarian freedom, you still have a flavor of compatibilism because, you know, if this is the case, then our range of thoughts and actions uh, might be determined by who we are, which is ultimately not up to us, right? This this range of options. Right. Uh, I don't have the ability to uh, jump to the top of a 50-story skyscraper, right? That's not within my ability, but I do have the power to 
uh, jump, a, you know, I can jump or not jump, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, there's some things I can't do. Uh, based on who I am, it, it, it shrinks, it, you know, it's, I'm not omnipotent, right? <laughs> but I, I do have the power to do some things, right. and many things that I don't do, uh, arguably. So anyway, if this is the case, then the, the range of thoughts and actions might be, be determined by who we are, and that is ultimately not up to us, but we still have a range of options from which to choose that is up to us, that's each compatible with who we are. So God creates us with a nature, arguably, that can choose between a range of options, each compatible with our nature. So that range of options isn't up to me, but how I choose within that range is up to me. And again, I think Calvin, Luther, and Melanchthon would agree. And I know there's scholarly Calvinists out there today. I've listed some of them already who would affirm that also. So it's not just, uh, you can't just dismiss it. What do you mean up to me? It seems as though on your view, God decrees. And so the specific thing that you choose, you choose it because Freely. God created a world in which you in would which choose it. In which I will. It. Yeah. In which so, you will choose it. So God created a world in which he knew how I would freely choose. So God, okay, so let me say it this way. God knows how I would freely choose if he creates me and even if he never does create me. So God knows how I would freely choose if. Creative decree. Now God knows, it goes from God knows how I would freely choose. Now it is transformed into God knows how I will freely choose. So just because would changes to will, the word freely doesn't magically disappear. The word freely is still there. Yeah. And, and so, and so uh, if, if God knows how I will freely choose based on a range of alternative options, each compatible with my nature, Okay. If he creates me and then he creates me, I still have that range of options, each compatible with my nature. But now it's how I will freely choose among those range of options. I guess and so. It's I predestined don't... and guaranteed. Yeah. It's just not causally determined. Yeah. And that's where I... the debate is, really. Right. I guess I don't want to jump ahead because I know you're going to get there. But I guess in the back of my mind is this idea of the grounding objection. I'm not yeah. trying to. I'm trying to. Well, connect let the me dots let me what you're saying yeah, yeah. without jumping uh, there because I know you're getting right, there. right. Yeah, I am going to get there. <laughs> That's why I'm but saying, man, hey, look, I'll I'm tell you. Kind of well, object. yeah. So, bottom line, though, bottom line, that's not a biblical objection. That's a purely philosophical objection, right? Well, and so, well, if it's a okay, but here's the thing. Mm. If, and I don't think it's a good objection, but I'm just saying point. it's not yeah. biblical. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, it is biblical to employ your mind to uh, to determine what's true, right, right? or false. So, right, right, right. So I would say whether it's a philosophical objection or a biblical objection, um, if the, if philosophically it doesn't work, then by definition it's false, even if it's not a biblical definition. Okay, I'll so give you saying. that. But and, so, and, and I'm not saying it is. I'm just having, I'm struggling, and I, yeah. I'm not saying this as kind of like. You know, give me an answer. You know, I'm just saying right, right, right. I'm, I'm having difficulty connecting the dots as you're explaining right, right. the choice. Because well, I know that really the reason, one of the reasons why if man is libertarianly free, that's largely connected with the idea that because God's counterfactual of creaturely freedom, it, it is located prior to the decree. And so because it's located logically prior to the decree, it seems as though liber- a sort of libertarian free will would follow. Um, otherwise, if it's if God's knowledge of counterfactuals of creaturely freedom are logically located after the decree, then a determinism would seem to follow. Right. So, so I'm trying to connect the dots. How do we understand God's knowledge of counterfactuals of creaturely freedom logically prior to the decree? How can they have truth values independent of the decree, even though you're going to get there? Because we haven't gotten there yet, that's the roadblock that is uh, holding you back from with everything else you're saying in regards to the freedom right. of choices and stuff, if that makes well, sense. Yeah, well, if you don't mind, I mean, you're the boss here, but if you don't mind, I'd like to wait because okay, I that's do fine. have... You can take okay. your time. You're the guest, so it's not that I'm the boss. You're the guest. <laughs> I, that's why I haven't done much right. here. I'm not mm-hmm. trying to uh, give too much pushback. I want you to explain your view. I If, if you're getting there, then go ahead. Tell yeah, I, I promise... We're going to get there. And I will point to other sources okay. uh, that okay. will go into much greater philosophical depth than right. uh, I will today. But I'll get there, and, I'll, and I have some things to say. 
And real quick, if I have Calvinist friends who will be listening to this and watching this, and perhaps you're frustrated that I'm not giving pushback where they think I should be giving pushback, my intention with, with having you on when you suggested that you wanted to come on was never to give pushback necessarily. I just honestly wanted to know yeah. how do you respond to the various points that Dr. White responded to, and I wanted to give you the opportunity to do that. So if people are upset that I'm not giving uh, as much pushback, that was never my original intention. I, I really am curious <laughs> yeah. how, when you get to that point, how you get there, and I want to understand it as best as I can. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And and I promise I'll get there. Okay. Um, I just have a, a list of things, uh, sure. mostly in order that, that okay. uh, James White said. And so I guess the next thing I want to uh, address is when uh, White said, if middle knowledge is before the divine decree to create, then it's going to limit what God can and cannot do to get to a certain end. Uh, so... Um, if God has, I would respond by saying, if God has the power to create a free creature whom is not always causally determined to think or act, then uh, God middle knows what this free creature would do. And clearly, this seems to be a great making property as opposed to a so-called limitation. I, I just don't understand how this is a limitation on White's view because this doesn't seem to be a limitation at all. It seems to be what contributes to a maximally great being. I mean, after all, uh, if, if God doesn't like what a certain free creature would freely do, then God can either causally determine this creature in a certain instance. I'm not opposed to that. Or God can create or, or choose not to create that creature or this world with that creature in it. Right. God's not limited by this. He can, he's got the power. He can choose to actualize uh, a free creature or not. And if he's got middle knowledge, then he would know if he wants to create this creature or not. And he can also choose to create a free creature and determine him occasionally. Uh, I'm not, yeah, like I said, I'm not opposed to that. But but God is not limited by knowledge. I don't even know what that means to say that God is, to, to say that anybody could be limited by knowledge. I mean, it seems, it seems crazy to assert that knowledge limits anyone because knowledge is power, isn't it? it seems to I me. guess he so, sees, as I understand him, I guess he, he sees that the knowledge of uh, that God has of what a free creature would do limits the possible world that God can create. And I don't want to put words in his mouth, but it seems as though that might be his objection. Kind of like there's certain worlds that God won't create because it would conflict with what a libertarianly free creature would choose. And he's, you know, you're trying to come up with a view that kind of holds these in a compatible way. So it seems as though he's okay. limited by hypothetical choices that a, that an uncreated undecreed person would hypothetically choose given a certain set of circumstances. Yeah, but that's not a limit because so say God knows how free creatures would choose if he creates them. And he's like, ah, that's horrible. Then he doesn't have to create them. Okay. Uh, or he can create them. Maybe he's like, oh, creatures will freely choose according to my perfect plan. In all these instances, except for this one. Okay, then I'm going to step in and causally determine this guy. Okay. He can still do that. Um, so there's no limits. I mean, God is the maximally great being. So and if God could causally determine an individual. Then that person's not free in that sense. Right. But yeah. would that, say, suppose God causally determine someone to do something and that person is damned does god have a right to damn such a person that he causally determines okay different question i mean so let's just say god wanted a guy to wear a blue shirt but he freely would have chosen a red shirt well god can step in and say no nah, we're in the blue shirt today right um right but now jumping to the other uh, topic <laughs> I'm of sorry, damnation I'm sorry. you don't have to answer it if you think it goes way too off topic yeah i think it way i, I think it does that's why uh, uh but I think in my notes, I get there uh, eventually, actually start okay. talking about applying. So basically, I should just be quiet because your notes go to all the questions. Well, that I'm <laughs> I don't know. I should have sent you my notes before we started. That would be great. <laughs> I take them anyway afterwards. I'll, I'll send them to you. I'll send all them to right, you. Cool. All right. So, um, so I don't see middle knowledge as uh, a limit at all. I think it. I think knowledge is power and it adds to his maximal greatness. Uh, God's not limited by anything. Uh, he knows everything that he could do, all things that are logically possible. 
Mm. And, uh, and he also knows all that would happen if he did it. This entails middle knowledge. And uh, it's just what follows from an omnipotent and omniscient being. If, if God is omnipotent and omniscient, uh, he's going to have middle knowledge. And this is no limitation at all. In fact, I've got, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head what it's entitled, um, but it has to do with the topic of uh, if uh, Molinism and middle knowledge uh, limits God. And I, I think I, so yeah, search my website. Um, I do discuss this in, in more depth and detail. But um, another thing that White said is that uh, middle knowledge partakes of elements of both natural and free knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't like that uh, that wording. Uh, I think it causes more confusion uh, to the masses. <laughs> so divine middle knowledge is simply what God knows with certainty regarding what would happen based on all he could do. I guess you could say that it partakes of natural knowledge because it logically follows from it, but it's not the same thing or even part of the same thing. You know, I'll just say it this way. Knowledge of the would is philosophically different than knowledge of the could. I'll say it again. Knowledge of the would is philosophically different than knowledge of the could. Those are two different things. So it doesn't partake. It doesn't definitely, uh, I mean, uh, if, like I said, if God knows all that he could do, then it follows that if he's omniscient, that he, that he knows all that would happen based on everything he could do. So that's a different thing. It just is different. It doesn't matter uh, if the people in the Middle Ages believed it. It doesn't matter if Augustine realized it. It doesn't matter if uh, Molina ever came up with the idea at all. It doesn't matter that he was a Spanish Jesuit priest. None of that matters. Mm -hmm. Um, It just matters if it logically follows uh, from God's knowledge of the could, everything he could do. Um, And so... I don't like to get bogged down in people's intention. What was Molina's intention? And what did people through the last, you know, few centuries think about it? That just, that, that's irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So moving on. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, White said something like Craig's always asked the question if this is the best of all possible worlds. Um, and is, is God saving the most people that he can? And, this does get philosophical here, and perhaps I missed something, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think White clarified the difference between possible and feasible worlds. I know that you're familiar with that distinction. Um, but if one's going to pontificate about why this application of Molinism doesn't work, uh, then one shouldn't ignore this vital difference. And I, I believe that Dr. Craig has made it clear that this is not the best possible world. Uh, be that as it may, perhaps this is the best feasible world, or at least a tide for the best feasible world, as Kirk McGregor would say. Um, that is to say, you know, maybe I can say it like this, that this is the best possible world God can create full of free creatures. Uh, so that, and I think God would have reasons to create free creatures because I think it allows for a true, or maybe it's better to say a maximal love, which I think is the essence of salvation. Um, and because God thinks it's important to have uh, moral and at least rational creatures. Um, and so I think libertarian freedom is vital for each of these concepts. But, um, so, but with that in mind, uh, this could be the best possible world God can create full of free creatures. So that means the best feasible world. But, that, but the best possible world is one in which nobody goes to hell. That's possible but given libertarian freedom if god says hey it's a it's important to me to create creatures with libertarian freedom then what these free creatures will do will freely do even if it's possible for universal salvation god knows that it won't happen freely and if freedom is important to god then uh then this could be the best feasible world even if it's not the best possible world so anyway possible worlds in which determinism does not always apply is how I like to explain feasible worlds. And and really, I think a good uh, intro to the difference between possible and feasible worlds is a blog uh, that I wrote on my website entitled, Could Adam Avoid the Apple? It's what, when people don't know the difference between the two, I like to start them with that article. Could Adam Avoid the Apple? The key word is could. So, but here's the bottom line. 
no creature that actually exists limits God. So God can freely choose to rule out some of his options on his own. You can call that a limitation if you'd like. I don't. That's based on his will and his good pleasure, right? But, but, but you know, so God can rule out some of his options by choosing to create libertarian creatures, but he doesn't have to. But this limitation might be according to his perfect plan to allow humans to be rational and moral agents capable of experiencing a true and maximal love, which I, again, I say is the essence of salvation. But, you know, don't take this literally to everybody listening out there, right? Don't uh, say that Tim Stratton actually thinks this is how it works. I just want to say this to kind of get people to think uh, as an illustration, but it's kind of like it's, or it's as if, Oh, I smell uh, heresy coming. I yeah, smell right, heresy right. coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I hope this doesn't get, uh, you know, like the, the God's got to play the cards he's been dealt okay, objection. Might, we'll talk about that. So be very careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'll just say it like this. It's as if God, before his creative decree, said, it's important for me to create free creatures for several reasons. With that in mind, let's see what my options are. Okay, now. God doesn't have to, he could examine his options. Again, I'm using this as an illustration. He could go, because I don't think this is how it happens. God's got perfect knowledge. He just knows. He's not going to look and see what's going on here. This is an illustration. So if he says, hey, it's important for me to create free creatures for many reasons. Uh, so with that in mind, let's see what my options are. And if he sees his options are not good and nothing aligns with this perfect plan, uh, then he doesn't have to create it. He could just determine everything across the board. But let's say he's like, oh, look at this. Here's a great world full of free creatures. I'm going to actualize this because once I actualize it, it's predestined. It will happen. Even all the things that are happening freely. And so everything's predestined across the board. Uh, election is still true. Um, it's just that we're not, we don't have exhaustive causal determinism. You've just got predestination. And, and in one of the arguments I'll give later, I'll show, I'll, I'll, I think, deductively conclude that predestination and causal determinism ought not be conflated, but I'll get to that soon. So another, th another thing that White said, um, and, and now I think we're going to get to what you wanted to talk about here, Eli. Mm -hmm. He said, I've never heard anyone offer a meaningful basis for grounding this, uh, I believe middle knowledge, not only in scripture, but in explaining where does this knowledge come from, right? Did it, do you think I quoted that basically correct? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. I think, okay. So first of all, just to keep it simple, God's knowledge comes from the same place God's power comes from. He simply has all power and all knowledge. And I don't have to know how God has it. I don't, know how, I don't have to know how a maximally great being is maximally great. We simply know that God is necessarily and always both omnipotent and omniscient. We can derive that from Scripture. And with this in mind, uh, White brings up what, you know, I just referenced it, what he refers to as the most infamous of Dr. Craig's claims. And when uh, Dr. Craig said, God's got to play the cards he's been dealt. And Eli, I like how you pointed out that there's been much criticism of how White objects to this illustration. And White jumped in and he said, well, it's not my illustration. And you clarified brilliantly, I think. And you said, but I, I think people are familiar with your criticisms of it. I, I think uh, James White has made that quote famous. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> uh, because James White has made Craig's car dealer illustration famous or perhaps infamous we need to discuss white's criticism of this analogy and we'll get into some of these grounding things mm -hmm. uh, too so um yeah i think uh many times folks don't really try to understand the proper context in which craig's comment was made or what exactly was meant by his comment and I don't think that's being charitable. So that's one critique I'd, I'd have uh, respectfully saying, I don't think we're being charitable to Dr. Craig here because, you know, charity demands we really try to find the best case scenario. What is the best that this person actually is meaning here? 
Right. And like, like I said, I don't want people saying, you know, when I said, well, it's as if God was saying it's important. To me. Like, I don't think that that's actually how it goes. I'm just saying, hey, here's a way to start thinking about it that might help us make sense. And I think Dr. Craig is trying to offer an illustration to help laymen wrap their heads around this. And, um, you know, and doing hermeneutics is that too. We want to aim at the correct meaning of what the author had in mind. And, and Dr. Craig is simply using uh, what he calls a façon de parler. And I don't speak French, but I guess that's French for a figure of speech. The manner of speaking, yeah. Yeah, manner of speaking, yeah. Uh, that many Molinists, uh, or I should say anti-Molinists, uh, incorrectly take literally. So Dr. Craig here is not implying that there's a literal cosmic card dealer, right? I've, I've seen these memes going around um, saying that Dr. Craig thinks there's actually a, a cosmic card dealer out there who's giving God See, cards I never to play. Thought, well, even when I first heard before Dr. Craig, uh, Dr. White's criticism, I never um, looked at it. At, well, when I saw like God, when, when he says God has to deal, uh, <clears throat> he has to play the card that he's been dealt. I always saw that as, He's the card dealer because he desired right. a. He deals with the cards that he deals himself, given his desire to have a, namely libertarian yeah. and creatures. Even though I yeah. might not agree right. with the system, that's how I understood it when I first. Uh, it's not there's not this abstract dualistic entity right. that's out there dealing him these cards. So I never really understood it in that way. So I never found that objection well, to be, even as a well, Calvinist. I have a, yeah. I well, it's because you're a former Molinist. <laughs> right. So, I mean, seriously, Eli, of all the Calvinists I know, you really seem to have the best idea of what it is you object to, you know. And so you don't make the same mistake that I think White does and at least his at least many of his followers do um, when it comes to things like this, because you understood what Dr. Craig meant. And, and Dr. Craig, because of this, I'll, I'll read a quote here from his sure. uh, his website. He, he understood that people were taking this out of context, and he says, quote, In no way is this meant to imply that there are actual entities or things outside of God that he has to deal with. This is simply an illustration of the fact that the truth value of these counterfactuals of freedom is not unilaterally determined by God. The libertarian freedom is truly possible, end quote. So let me, let me bring those cookies down to the bottom shelf. I'll try here anyway. I think what... What Craig means is that if God were to create creatures whom he would not always causally determine, which would be, I contend, logically possible for an omnipotent God to do, then these non-determined and libertarian-free creatures would make some choices that God would not causally determine. It seems to follow logically. Thus, these choices would be free in a libertarian sense. So there's no logical... Uh, contradiction found in the proposition God has the power to create creatures who are libertarianly free to think, choose, and act. Right? Uh, there, that's not like saying God created a married bachelor or drew a triangle with four corners or anything like that. So there's no logical contradiction there. So if one claims that God cannot create libertarian creatures, like I said earlier, it seems to imply that God's not omnipotent since it's logically, uh, it's a logically coherent concept. Now, for the sake of argument, even if humans do not possess libertarian free will or libertarian freedom in this world, uh, like we've already discussed, I believe it's possible for God to create worlds where creatures do possess libertarian freedom and can freely choose, I, it seems to me, one way or the other. So with this in mind, free creatures even if they were not actually created, would be free to choose one way or another. If God really is omniscient and knows the truth value to all propositions eternally without beginning, then God middle knows how these free creatures, if they were to be created, God knows how they would freely choose. Now, on a side note, I have argued that at length on my website and in my dissertation and um, elsewhere in uh, academic journal, I've argued that, that God would want to create beings with libertarian free will so that they could be in a true love relationship with him. And I've gone into that in depth and detail, that a, a true love relationship uh, requires um, libertarian freedom. But moreover, I've demonstrated that, that Calvinists uh, 
I don't know if I should open this can of worms right now, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, Calvinists such as John Piper run into a car dealer objection, if you will, with some of the things he said. Uh, so, you know, I'll just point people to the article uh, I wrote where I discussed this on my website. Uh, okay. It's called Playing the Cards God's Been Dealt. I deal with James White. I, I deal with John Piper. Um, and I show where the, you know, if this is going to be an objection, the bigger objection is going to be in the hand of the Calvinist. <laughs> or, I mean, it's going to be objecting to their cards that they've got or that they're uh, objecting to. So uh, th that is to say they've got the bigger problem. But anyway, let me get back to the main point. It's vital ask, to ask uh, oneself two questions. Is God powerful enough to create free creatures um, who can, so to speak, freely deal some cards Unless one can demonstrate some hidden logical contradiction, if they deny this, then it seems to deny God's impotence, omnipotence, or so it seems to me. And two, the second question is this. If God is powerful enough to create free creatures, is he intelligent enough to know how these free creatures would freely choose? Or that is to say, what cards they would freely deal if God creates them. And like you said, uh, God's the ultimate card dealer here. He gets to decide. Uh, I mean, he knows how a free dealing car dealer, <laughs> uh, that makes sense, how a, how a free dealing uh, uh, person with cards, <laughs> how they, how they would, what you're trying to say. yeah, yeah, yeah. He knows what they're going to deal and he can choose to create that world or not. So again, there's no logical contradiction in stating that God knows the truth value to counterfactual propositions, right? It might be a mystery as to how God knows these things, but it's also a mystery as to how God created the universe from nothing. So, so right? okay, so there, there is where, okay, so if I were, if you're walking down the street and I happen to recognize you and I say, hey, Tim, I got to ask you a quick question. I just want you to give me a straight, straightforward answer without explaining the details. Just assume I have background knowledge. If I were to say, what is the answer to the grounding objection? Would you say, of course, you'd, you'd have to expand on stuff. Would you say it's a mystery? Uh, on the street? <laughs> He's like, if we're on the street. <laughs> if we're on the street passing by each other and I don't have time to talk, the first yeah. thing I'm going to do is say, go look at my journal article in Perichoresis 16.2. Point point to your article. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in that, uh, my co-author and I, Equibus Erasmus, uh, offers probably a couple pages worth or more um, of, of why the grounding objection uh, doesn't work. So I'm going to point my point your listeners to that article too. Uh, they can also find an article that he wrote on Free Thinking Ministries on that. But if I don't even have time to say that, I'm going to say, yeah, I don't know how God knows. I okay. just know that he knows. I just know that he's omniscient. And I'll say, by the way, I don't know how God created the universe from nothing either, but I know God's omnipotent. So we know that God's omnipotent and thus can create the universe from nothing. And we know that God is omniscient and therefore knows the truth value to all propositions, including counterfactual propositions. But the bottom line is this, when it comes to this card dealer thing, and I'll, I'll talk more about this uh, grounding thing, but when it comes to the card dealer thing, I would just say, let's be charitable and make a sincere attempt to properly understand what Dr. Craig means when he offers right. a metaphor in order to make a hard subject easier to understand the lay person you know <laughs> so that's all i want to say about the, the card dealer um okay. but so yeah let's get let's get back to this i think we can do this with, with what white says uh at least next on my notes here i think this is an unsupported assertion that he said he said so yeah you have to have a creature to know what a creature is going to do all right now this gets us into the, the grounding objection um and let me just say the grounding objection is not one of my primary uh, focuses of study. I have okay. colleagues that do laser focus on this. I think what I offer in my dissertation and my uh, the academic journal article, uh, I think it's sufficient to refute it uh, or to at least not feel its force. Um, but I have friends that go deep into those philosophical waters, and some have written on the Free Thinking Ministries website, you know, uh, uh, John Limonto, for example, uh, has done quite a bit on this topic. Pardon me? 
I said he's a very sharp guy. We've had some private conversations over uh, Facebook yeah. Messenger. He knows his stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he's just, you know, like 18 years old <laughs> yeah. and scary smart. Way smarter than I'll ever be. Uh, it's, it's not fair, right? <laughs> uh, but But when White says you have to have a creature to know what a creature is going to do, I think mm -hmm. that's quite the claim, at least about God. Uh, this claim might be true regarding humans. I don't think it's always true, though, for example. I mean, I don't have a daughter. But I know that if I had a daughter, she would freely choose to sin. Right? So so I know some things. Well, uh, freely. Well, let's just, know. okay, let's just assume. Yeah. Well, all right. Okay, well, bracket that. Let's assume for the sake of argument that uh, she would possess libertarian freedom. So I know if I had a daughter who possesses libertarian freedom, that she would freely choose to sin. And maybe you don't like that uh, that example, but I don't even think that's the bigger the big issue. I think okay. here's the big the, here's the big question. If you're gonna say, yeah, you have to have a creature to know what a creature is going to do, why think that's true regarding a maximally great being? Why anthropomorphize and demand that this is the case for God? I mean, it, it's also true for humans that if we are going to create a house, we must use physical material that already exists. Mm -hmm. But surely James White would have... that this is not the case for a maximally great being. He can create ex nihilo out of nothing. I don't know how, but but we know based on the Bible and, and thinking theologically that of course mm -hmm. God can create ex nihilo out of nothing. He does not need a previously existing phys physical material like humans do. So surely, if James White would agree to that, why would he anthropomorphize and then claim that since it's true for humanity, then it must be true for God? Like I said, God can create ex nihilo out of nothing, so why can't God's knowledge operate in a similar manner? And it's assertions true. don't cut it, though. Arguments yeah. are required. And yeah, there's yeah. There, there's big debate out there. But with, sure. I, I, I'm just, at the end of the day, if and I do know a minority of Christians who say, no, it's impossible for God to create out of nothing. They say it's logically impossible. Uh, that that uh, and so some will say there had to be pre-existing material. Others will say that idealism is true and that physical matter doesn't really exist. Well, I think we're we're justified in rejecting that. And that I don't saying, think it's the same thing, though, Tim. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not I'm saying it's the same thing. I'm saying why can't it be similar, right? That's what I said. Why can't it operate in a similar manner? And so, uh, it is mysterious. I don't know how God has the power to create out of nothing, and I don't know how God possesses his middle knowledge. It could But be. I affirm omnipotence and omniscience. Right. Well, it it's possible that the idea is logically incoherent. You'd have to admit that it's possible since well, you say it's 
since that you is, say it's mysterious, I, here's the thing. I think there's a well, lot. Okay, of but it's not. But it's not in the same vein as saying God can create a married bachelor or a dry triangle with four corners. There's well, no. I'm saying, yeah. You're arguing for broad meta. You're you're not even arguing for it. You're you're asserting it might be, uh, uh, well, well, broadly saying, logically well, impossible. All I'm saying is, it seems to me, and I'm not saying that I'm right, but it seems to me be, that because God is a maximally great being and He's original, that I don't see how it's possible for Him to create creatures that are completely, or at least in some sense, autonomous in their choice. Maybe you, that's not what you're saying. Well, I don't use the and, and White does this a lot too. We don't need to say autonomous. What no, we're that, arguing that's, for, well, we're argu Let's stick with our definitions. Can okay. God create? To, I mean, I can I can give you a deductive argument that God has the ability to create, or that God has the ability to choose between a range of options, uh, of alternative options, each compatible with His nature. That's all you need to show that the concept of libertarian freedom is logically coherent. So you so don't see autonomy it. wrapped up in the idea of I don't like the word autonomy, and I think that creates... Uh, we Let's just stick with the definition. Well, wait, right? time, time, Does, time out, time out, time out, time out, time out. I have to say time out. Okay. That's like saying, that's like saying when... Um, I remember we had a conversation a long time ago, and you might not remember, where you kept on using, like, God forces us and i said well it's really not force he's like yeah well it's practically that and i could have said well the force is not a helpful term but if you're convinced okay. that that's what my view entails then i think you have a right to use that word and show why you consider it that way in like fashion yeah you know, the calvinist what the, i think and i'm not saying that they're correct i'm just saying that one of the things that bothered some calvinists is that when we do speak of libertarian free will there seems to be, and I might be incorrect, there seems to be yeah. some notion of how we understand autonomy, this kind of original uh, choice and decision that is seems to me underived from, from, from God or, or in, in some way or decrees or whatever. And so maybe that's not the case, but that's what it sounds like. And it becomes a barrier in my mind to track with you. And I'm not saying okay. that's, that's what it is. I'm saying I'm trying to track with you. And that, that kind of is, it, that idea is kind of creeping into the discussion. Maybe it shouldn't be. But well, it, okay. I'll, I'll just say this. I mean, so to your first point, okay. causally determine. If God causally determines something, that's what I'm arguing against. And it seems to me that saying if God causally determines me to raise my right hand, then... Uh, he forces me to raise my right hand. Now, uh, now, don't there like that to, word. There seems to oppose. A, there seems to assume in the word force that there's a struggle that I want to do one thing. No, God forces me to do another. No, no, I don't say that there has to be a struggle. You don't I, say that, but the word force seems to entail. I, I'm well. I'm saying that it's it's not necessarily entailed. Okay. All right. So uh, now, when it comes to libertarian free will, I'm going. I define that as the ability. Just like God has this ability, the mm -hmm. the ability to choose between a range of options, each of which is compatible with our image of God nature. Now, if one wants to say, well, that's autonomy, fine. But what I mean by that, I mean, we, what I'm going to argue for is God has the ability to create creatures who possess the ability to choose between a range of alternative options, each of which is compatible with our image of God nature. If you say that means autonomy, fine. But I, but, uh, do you think that autonomy is equal to my definition of libertarian freedom? I don't know. I'd, I'd, as, I'd have to tease that out a bit and think about it. So I'm not okay. sure. So, so if autonomy equals my definition, I, I say fine, use it. But if there's any slight difference, then I say get it out of here because then it's a <laughs> false conflation. Okay. Um, so um, now I don't see a false conflation between causal determinism and force. Um, especially when you clarify and you're like, is there a struggle? I said, no, it's not necessary. Um, and so that's why I don't see a, a problem with using the word force, especially, um, you know, I mean, I usually don't use the word force when I'm writing academically. I will write, I will use the word causally determined. Um, okay. But in, no, in, in my head, that means force to me. And if somebody can show me why exactly that shouldn't follow, right? Yeah, sure. So anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I'll say it's a mystery to me as to how God is omnipotent. It's also a mystery. 
I just know he is, and it's also a mystery to me how God is omniscient. I just know he is. And we can use scripture to derive this. We can appeal to perfect being theology to derive this. In fact, I've got an argument in my dissertation. It's on my website, too, if people want to go find it, where I argue that a maximally great being must possess middle knowledge. And I go on to extensively argue why uh, it's maximally greater to possess middle knowledge than not to possess it. And I don't think you can run those arguments by saying, well, it'd be more maximally great to be able to draw a triangle of four corners. I, I think that will eventually fall apart and show no, that's not a great making property. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I point people to my website and my hopefully soon be published dissertation on that. Um, uh, let's see here. I'm going to skip a few things because how long have we been talking? It's been, uh, it seems like it's an hour and 45. So we, we do want to draw it to a close, not because I don't want it to continue, but because if it gets too long, I'm not sure anyone, I'm yeah. not at that level yet, like uh, <laughs> right, where, he, where I can put out a jumbo, a jumbo revealed apologetics yeah. apologetic where people well, would, would watch it. Um, it doesn't matter. So I had a lot more I wanted to say, but man, okay. you're just so much, you're so easy to talk to and we can just, <laughs> we can talk all night. Let me jump to, um, Let's see. You, I really appreciated this, and maybe you don't have me in mind. Um, but when when I heard you asking this, I'm like, oh, he's thinking of of uh, my my favorite argument, um, what I spend the most time on, uh, the free thinking argument. And uh, and you said you asked Dr. White. You said uh, Calvinism is often associated with universal divine determinism. I was or, thinking you know, of you. <laughs> you are, yeah, thank I you. I knew you would. I, I knew like, you were. people say. Mind, say <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And, you know, you, you talked about, you know, that we're uh, nothing but puppets on Calvinism and things like that. Um, and then you asked, how would you respond to the idea that if this, you know, exhaustive divine determinism. Yeah. By the way, I'm going to stop you real quick. And okay. this might make you feel happy. I have to think about how I would word it. Um, and I don't think I'd be able to word it to your satisfaction because we're going to disagree over definitions. But um, not that I disagree with Dr. White's view in general. I did not find his response to my question as it stood in that conversation as persuasive. I kind of, it kind of seemed, and I don't want to accuse him of dodging, but it seemed as though he dodged the import of my question. And so I wasn't satisfied with how he responded, although in a general sense, if we had a longer, kind of more casual talk, I probably would agree with his explanation. I don't think he gave a good one when we well, had a conversation there. I appreciate you saying that, uh, and I guess I don't really have to say too much anymore <laughs> because I'll, I'll say a little bit. But uh, yeah, I, I, I've listened to his response several times, and it just, I just, I don't even know uh, what it meant. Um, but, you know, you, you asked him, how would you respond to this very common objection? Basically, you know, I th let me read it here. He said uh, um, that you, if exhaustive divine determinism is true, you don't use that word. But then he said, I think this is a quote here, then you cannot hold to Calvinism rationally since you've been determined to do that. That really just has a self-refuting foundation that even if it were true, you couldn't know. You couldn't know it to be true because you've been determined all the way around. And then he said, how would you respond to that very common objection? Mm -hmm. And so thank you for asking that question. Uh, White's response was, well, it's common, but it's not well thought out. And that just, oh, I mean, man, that irked me, man, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> I've got a, an entire master's thesis focused on this argument and a PhD, a PhD dissertation um, which focuses on this from the same university that James White attends right. that demonstrates that this objection is actually thoroughly thought out quite nicely. Well, there's so, a big difference between saying it's not well thought out and it's false. It right. Can be well thought out, but false. It's like yes, you exactly. You can't make it look like people haven't thought about this question because they obviously That's right. have. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, what, what Dr. White offered is a, a refutations of this argument mm -hmm. uh, he said things that it was just an emotional feelings based objection and that if you push it back far enough uh, what the person is saying is and this is a quote unless you have creaturely autonomy and no decree at all there can be no reality to anything that God does in time that's fundamentally what is being said and then White concludes quote 
that fundamentally destroys the reality and importance of the actions of Jesus and the incarnation. And I just don't understand this. I mean, I would love to have him flesh this out more, but let's uh, let's say that the, the free thinking argument that I've spent years and years now, I mean, I think I first crafted it in 2011 or 2012, maybe. Um, and I've spent the, the majority of my academic work focused on this argument now. And, and the free thinking argument has absolutely nothing to do with feelings or emotions. Absolutely nothing. It's a logically sound, it's, va- it's valid, it's structurally valid, and the premises seem to be true. That, thus, it's a sound argument. So it's got nothing to do with feelings or emotions. And second, he brings up the incarnation of Christ, but it has absolutely nothing to do uh, the, the incarnation has nothing to do with the free thinking argument. So let's quickly examine the argument's premises to see if it's based on feelings, emotions, or Christmas, you know, the incarnation. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, and I won't give the whole thing. I'm just going to give the core of sure. the free thinking argument. It's not against naturalism, not against Calvinism. It's simply for libertarian freedom it says nothing about god christianity calvinism Arminianism, arminianism open theism atheism naturalism or any other ism so here's the core it's a two premises and a conclusion one if humans are not free in the libertarian sense they cannot either rationally infer or rationally affirm claims of knowledge two humans can rationally infer and rationally affirm claims of knowledge three therefore humans are free in the libertarian sense so i'm sure that White will want to affirm the second premise. So the key premise is the first. But with that in mind, think about this. If all of our thoughts and beliefs are always forced, there's that word, causally determined upon us all the time, and we can never have chosen better thoughts and beliefs, then we are simply left assuming that our determined thoughts and beliefs are good, let alone that our beliefs are true. Therefore, then we can never rationally affirm that our beliefs really are the inference to the best explanation. We can only assume it. And that assumption would not be up to you either. It's simply completely out of our control. So here's the significant problem for the exhaustive determinist, whether it be uh, naturalistic or divine, right? It, It logically follows that if naturalistic determinism or divine determinism is true, then determinists or anyone else for that matter cannot possess uh, justification for their specific beliefs, which is traditionally and typically minimally required for knowledge, for claims of knowledge. Um, so one can happen to have true beliefs. However, if they do not possess justification for a specific uh, a specific belief, then their belief then would not qualify as a knowledge claim, at least traditionally. So with this in mind, if one cannot freely infer the best explanation, then one has no justification that their belief really is the best explanation. And without justification for a belief, any claim of knowledge uh, regarding said belief seems to go down the drain. And all we're left with is question-begging assumptions, um, which I don't think is, uh, you know, it seems that knowledge goes down the drain here. But obviously, humans possess the ability to rationally affirm claims of knowledge, as I'm sure James White agrees. He on his dividing line show, he's always uh, offering claims of knowledge, right? right? So to argue against this would affirm it, as one would have to offer claims of knowledge to the contrary. Mm-hmm. And moreover, if one rejects the ability to rationally affirm knowledge claims, well, why should anybody listen to him? Anyway, I know that White's not going to do that. So therefore, if that's the case, then libertarian freedom is possessed by humanity, at least when it comes to thinking things through, right? Does James White have the ability to evaluate and judge uh, one way or the other if Molinism is the inference to the best explanation or not? Note the range of options from which to choose. And if one doesn't have a range of options, then you're left in no epistemic position to rationally affirm your thoughts and beliefs. Mm -hmm. So a short thought experiment clarifies my point nicely, I think. Um, I'm I'm going to substitute uh, James White in here uh, to to help. So suppose a mad scientist somehow uh, got control of uh, Dr. White's uh, brain. And so this mad scientist now exhaustively controls and causally determines all of James White's thoughts and beliefs all the time. And this includes exactly what White thinks of and about and exactly how White thinks of and about it. 
So all of White's thoughts about his beliefs and all of White's beliefs about his thoughts are caused and determined by the mad scientist. And this also includes the next words that will come out of James White's mouth. So here's a question for Dr. White. How can you, not the mad scientist, rationally affirm the current beliefs in your head as good, bad, better, the best, true, or probably true, note the range of options from which to choose, without begging the question? Good luck with that. It's impossible. So then I just say replace the mad scientist with physics and chemistry or God or anything else. And one has the exact same rationality problems, but for different reasons. However, since James White does possess the ability to rationally infer and affirm knowledge claims and to argue otherwise is to affirm it, well, then we know that at least James White possesses the libertarian freedom to think and take certain steps while deciding what he ought to affirm and believe. And since libertarian freedom seems to be metaphysically impossible if humanity is nothing but physical stuff, we can rationally infer that humanity is more than merely the physical, and we can start to get into the soul and the image of God and what that means. So anyway, with all of this in mind, notice what is irrelevant to the free thinking argument. I've not made any appeal to emotions or feelings, only facts and logic. And also notice that this argument has nothing to do with Christmas. And, <laughs> and it also says nothing about five-point Calvinism. So you can still be a five-point Calvinist and affirm uh, the free-thinking argument and affirm limited libertarian freedom like Greg Kokel does. He's an ardent five-point Calvinist, but he's, he's going to agree with me when it comes to the, uh, the, the free-thinking argument. So you can be a... a, a I, I really... I don't think Calvinists should appeal to exhaustive divine determinism. They can... They can appeal to determinism when it comes to salvation. I disagree with that personally, but I will gladly say maybe I'm wrong about that and say, okay, fine, keep that. Keep keep your tool. But don't I don't think you should affirm exhaustive divine determinism. I don't think it's biblical, and it definitely doesn't make logical sense of uh, of all the data, from biblical data to logical data. Uh, and and you know, got I really not only does Kokel and Crisp um, and, and, and other uh, well-known uh, Calvinists, uh, Mueller, they will affirm that today. Uh, but but I really do believe that Luther, Calvin, and Melanchthon and other reformers, uh, you know, 500 years ago, based on their own words, and I've got their, like I said, I've got their block quotes in my dissertation. So stay tuned for that. But yeah. uh, I really believe they would affirm limited libertarian freedom. So so the question is then, if you've got limited libertarian freedom, which follows from the free thinking argument, and I can use biblical data to support this too. Uh, start with 1 Corinthians 10, 13. At least Christians have to seem to have this kind of freedom. But if if there's any kind of limited libertarian freedom anywhere, the question is, does did God know those free uh, choices logically prior to his creative decree was God surprised by it and is God did God predestine it these freak actions you know so if God's not surprised by it and if he knew uh, logically prior to his creative decree from eternity past and and uh, and God still is sovereign and predestines it then I don't see any other way to do it besides Molinism and middle knowledge so all that is, you know, sorry for just preaching a little sermon there. No, uh, that, but, that's fine. <laughs> okay, well, cool. I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you as we're coming, we're creeping up on the two hour mark. Uh, I could talk about this all night long, but right. uh, we, we want to keep it. Uh, this, this episode is going to be specifically for the nerds who want to go in. Uh, we are, from, we are big time nerds, right? That's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Um, uh, do you feel that you have had an adequate opportunity to fairly lay out your position? Yeah, I mean, I skipped a, a bunch of things I wanted to say, um, and some of the comments that White made, we uh, I skipped over for sure. the sake of time. But I feel pretty, uh, I'm, ha I'm happy with this, and I think it's a good place to start. People disagree with me, um, at least start here, and we'll see where it goes. Right, and, I, and I'm glad you said that, because it, it, the fact that you feel that you had a fair opportunity to kind of lay out the basic, I mean, obviously you can't cover everything, it, yeah. that means that it's mission accomplished. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, it's not all, and I gave a little pushback 
um, only because I've, I had questions on the spot. But well, you're I, a good host. A good host has to do well, that yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Right. I think there is there is great value in having the ability to listen without the immediate desire to respond so that you could just hear the case laid out. And at the end of the day, you know, you guys listen to this podcast, and I'm sure there are people who probably listen to it more than once, even though it's going to be a little over two hours. Um, you come at the end of your rope and you say, yeah, I don't know if I buy that. You know what? Mission accomplished. Yeah. And I think you right. agree with that as well. Yeah. Um, but as long as you've had a fair opportunity to lay those issues out, you obviously are someone who's committed to uh, upholding Christian truth. Um, just because we differ on this issue doesn't make you a heretic or someone who's putting the philosophy of man before, you know, God, they like, listen, yeah. we come, we come on different, uh, we end up on different sides of the, of the fence on this debatable issue with right. the household of faith. Yeah. Um, and, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not a Calvinist. I, I'm a, I'm a Molinist. Okay. <laughs> hey, know? yeah. Let's go out. Let's go out and evangelize people in the street. Let's go share the gospel. That's right. That's right. So, right, so again, right. and, and that's not to minimize the importance of the issues. Obviously, I hold my position mm-hmm. with conviction, just as you hold your your view with conviction. But we yes. need to be able to desire unity over unnecessary division. Yeah, and there's some things, things that are necessary. Right, right? and these and these. But this isn't one of them. Right. Yeah, it's important. It's important, right. but I don't think it's an issue that we. Uh, you know that I'd kick you out of the kingdom and uh, and vice versa. So, um, <laughs> right, right, right. So, w- with that said, um, if you guys are interested in um, looking at some of Tim's uh, articles, which I mean, even I'm I'm a Calvinist and I'm a presuppositionalist in my um, apologetic methodology. I have some debates on my podcast episodes. If you're interested in seeing how that works out and how it differs from a more uh, classical approach. You could um, listen to some previous podcasts with mm-hmm. the three or four debates that I've done. Um, coming from that perspective, I still can say without shame whatsoever that I greatly benefit from my classicalist brothers and mm-hmm. uh, what Tim puts out on his website um, when he goes over some of those issues. I think he does a wonderful job, and I think it would be foolish for mm-hmm. someone who identifies as a presuppositionalist to see literally no value in um mm-hmm veiling yourself of the material that some of our classical brothers um, have and vice versa. So check yeah. it out, Free Thinking Ministries, uh, Tim Stratton, Stratton is S-T-A, I'm sorry, S-T-R-A-T-T-O-N. That's uh, right. Free Thinking Ministries uh, dot org, is it? Dot com. I think both will get com. you there. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, right. Dot com. Um, and are, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we, before we close? I just really appreciate uh, this conversation, Eli. I think you're making you. uh, some some waves for God's glory in this world. I, I really love you as a brother. I respect you as an academic, as a Christian thinker, and you sharpen me like iron. And uh, I got your back. I got your back, brother. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've seen those pictures of you with uh, the going out and shooting. I'm glad you got me back. <laughs> you're much tougher than I am. Like I, mm, I don't know. Movie, so it's all a show. Know. It's all a show. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to stop the recording here, but you can stay on. Uh, let me just.